Sonic Streamix? Yeah, episode 13. <laughs> We're in Longsport, Indiana, here to film Fiberglass Speaks Minicon. Petcon! Hola, we're coming. <laughs> Exclusive episode with Mark Wade. He also joins us for Breaking the Fourth Wall. Breaking the Fourth Wall! And we're going to show you the exclusive Batmobiles built by Mark Raker. Who? Raker. Raker. Mark Raker. 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 All right. And Carrie joins us in Collector's Case where he shows off Mark's personal collection. I got this now. I got this now. <laughs> <laughs> Big ass man out of the <laughs> Stay tuned. All that and more on this episode of Comics Remixed. You wait till the finish. <laughs> Come on, John. Oh. <laughs> Welcome everybody to another episode of Comic Streamix, an exclusive episode as we're out here at the Batman convention hosted by Fiberglass Freaks. Yep. We, I'm here with Junior Ruiz, as always. special guest Mark Wade, as he now is a Midwestern guy. That's right. Welcome to the Midwest, Mark. Thank you, sir. Yeah, really. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good to have you. Thank you, sir. How is it to live amongst corn? Oh, man. Uh, it's, it's, it is awesome. If you like, if you have stock in Sudafed and, and the allergens, then yeah, that's this place to be. Yeah. There you go. Oh my God. That's, that's your pitch from Mark. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, so we do what we always do. We get the ball rolling. Yeah. Uh, this week it was announced that Marvel was going to relaunch yet again with all new Marvel Now. Yeah. Why? Well, no, not all, not across the line. No? No. That's what the article I read said it was across the line and it was going to start in January with the Avengers books. <laughs> And Avengers, it was supposed to start in Avengers 24 point now. Right. And then it was also going to be a doubled as a number one. And then from there, it's going to, every week, you're going to get a new number one, especially Avengers related. Yeah, so, but it's not, but they're not, but it's not like the previous Marvel now, where it's not like they're, it's not like Avengers becomes Avengers. It's not that Avengers goes from Avengers 24 to Avengers 24 point now to Avengers volume six, number one. That's what I thought it was. I no, no. Not. get out of here. I'm so tired get of relaunching. Uh, no. Relaunching of a relaunch? Yeah. yeah. No, that would, what that article made. It, I think it was a uh, uh, comic price guy, I believe. Okay, that would suck. But that's no, no. It's just, it's just. That's a way of. There are, there. You know, the all new, the you know, all Marvel, all now, whatever it is. It's just a way of throwing a spotlight on some of the new launches that are coming up that okay, they've so got. Not everything. No, 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 no. So each time a team switches up or the yeah. new lineup, there's yeah. got to be like a, a very commercial hook along with it is that is that the thing that we're getting here it helps man i mean it helps there used to be there was a day when number ones would automatically sell no matter what that day is not with us anymore oh, right? well, no. so yeah. no more day of like let's just switch out the black panther for a giant guy there's nah, no more of that now they have you need more punch than that now you need i mean we you know marvel's decided that it used to be like if you had the right property or the right artist or the right writer any of those in the triangle any one of those could sell a comic, and then in the like, in, in, like ten years ago, it sort of became like you need two of those, yeah. and now it's like you need all three. You need the right writer and the right artist on the right book to really make some sort of blockbuster hit. Yeah, that, I, you know, I, I know. gotta disagree with you on that. Demi, what do oh, you got? Moon Knight by Bendis and Malib. Oh, that was a good run. But that, that's that was, where you, that's where I'm not sure you had the character then. Like, what that tells us is what that tells us is people don't want to read a Moon Knight book right now because if you did. That they be the guys. That's true. Yeah, because when I saw that creative team, I was like, okay, they're they're money. Because I oh yeah, yeah, you think stuff. exactly, exactly. And then when I saw Moon Knight was getting, I don't even think it got canceled at a uh, even number. Was it like eleven? Something like that. It, yeah, you know, yeah. It's yeah. Just like, no. I don't know. That really disappointed me. So how how do we go from uh, like let, let's take let's take fifty two as an example yeah. when when a lot of these third tier characters became yeah. super interesting. Yeah. How is it that how is it what's the writing what is the 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 I guess the the elements there that make them great, but they can't be great as solos. Well, it's the same as. But think about every TV show you ever love, man. Think about every, you know, not all those characters should be spin-off characters. Some characters are just built to be supporting characters, and they're not built to carry their own book. I don't know. I really like Frasier. 
That's true. That was a good spinoff. That's man. true, but yeah. but you know. Tell no, me one bad spinoff off the top of your head. All right. Uh, Joni loves Chachi. That's one right there. Yeah, that was pretty bad. Okay, we can stop there. <laughs> <laughs> we can stop there. I'm afraid of what you would say next. <laughs> think, about, think about the ones that would really suck, like you know Ted Baxter. Nobody would want to watch him. Cleveland show? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's man. not Family Guy. Right. Yeah. There's just it, there's places you can, you know there's nobody would really want to watch you know Mo the bartender every week the way they watch The Simpsons I would right. but you know I, yeah. I it's, it, it's a very selected audience it's just some characters are built to be supporting characters and even okay. even the ones who broke out in you know in '52 like Elongated Man and stuff they they're, they still it doesn't mean they were ready to carry their own book it just meant you had one really good story to tell about it. right 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 so over the past couple of years. Uh, sticking out with DC, a lot of has been going on as far as changing the guard in a lot of their books. As yeah. far as like the back end, uh, the, well, the the backstage stuff, like the writers and the illustrators, yeah. a lot of teams shifting yeah. around. You yourself have been involved in DC a lot for for a few yeah. projects here and there. Yeah. You know, just yeah. a few. Yeah, yeah, just a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and you also had thrill bent. So yeah. what what's your point of view? What is going on in DC editorial where people are like walking out <laughs> and then just straight up bashing them? It's just, what is happening there? It's clear they got a problem and it's and it really is that look they're uh, let me first off start by saying I don't read a lot of the DC books but that's not a spite thing. It's that it's, yes, it I'm, no, no, it's really, it's really not. It's, it's, it, no, it's, it's that I'm not the audience. I'm not the audience. They, they specifically now they, they tailored in the new 52. They tailored their audience specifically to long, either longtime fans, right, right, or you know what they think 17 year old boys want to read. Okay, and that's that's the there's that no porn in those DC books. Uh, close, you know. And there's a lot of violence, but there's a lot of gratuitous yeah. violence. It's a lot of gratuitous violence. Very true. Um, well, a lot of the heat started. Um, well, it became very mainstream. Like, I think the the second or third time Rob Liefeld got fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was around there. Yeah. Wait. No, no, no. He well, he said yeah, he, he quit. He said he quit because he's yeah. got a safe face. Because right, right. that, that's he's the legend. Yeah. Well, he's part of the legend that left yeah. and created the image. So, but it really is it, the, the micromanaging is just insane. The micro and I, the micromanaging there, which it, again, I get if you're talking about Superman or Batman or something where it's a a multi-billion-dollar icon and you've got to manage the brand and you got to make sure nobody does anything stupid with it. Although nobody is, but you know when you get down to Firestorm. Look, who cares? You know, I mean, no offense to Firestorm fans, but it's not like it's not like one bad Firestorm story is going to ruin the franchise. It's not like the character is going to be dead after you. Just, you at Marvel, well, because I think he can't die. That's true. He just combined with like a tree. That's true. Fire, <laughs> fire tree. Yeah, fire tree. Yeah. But you know, it, like a it, stick of gum, like, you know, ba bazooka, like bazooka Joe Firestorm. Look at Marvel; they've got the, the better idea, which is that you you still, if, as a freelancer at Marvel, you still can't do whatever you want to do. They still own the characters, but you know that going in. You know it's somebody right, else's right, right, sandbox. Yeah. But they give you a lot more latitude. They give you a lot more rope to tell your story. Okay. And and not second guess you. And I, I got to say, no, I no, I understand fully whenever an editor at any company says. You know, I'm not sure that works. I'm not sure we, we're comfortable with you doing that. How about this instead? That's fine, you know, because that's your property. But just, but when you say that to me, like after you've already given me permission to do it, or after I've already like put a lot of time and energy into it, and you said yes, and they come back and say, you know, and what? that's kind of what I find interesting here yeah, because when you're talking about brand and all the marketing, yeah, that, that's what I envision. I envision that before this was even like like storyboarded there right. was a meeting about this there right. was a conference course, exactly. people were on conference things calls. were signed off on exactly yep. a yep. lot of cost is going to this yep. build up here yep. and then how does it get down to like there's these super last minute changes is there like some producer out there who handed down a post-it note and it came down the kind ladder and kind of, that's yeah. what's happening is that that's what's really kind of is like they just it just just these sort of knee-jerk decisions and we had a lot of it in the last third of 52 when we saw it as we were starting to wrap up and you know they would come you know a certain you know a certain power player would come to us and go ah oh, you can't do that I'm like but we're on issue 49 of 52 right right and by the way it's elongated man who cares it's like it's like what are we going to ruin elongated man now it's why are you busting us over the tiny stuff like that but it, it it's just it's a control freak issue and at marvel like i said they they do a better job of you never know. You never doubt who's in, in charge, and you know who the boss is. But still, they make you feel like you're part of the creative process. And I've always said, when I, I, I worked as an editor at DC 25 years ago, and I learned from Dick Giordano, okay, who was the best editor 
and without Dick, you wouldn't have Dark Knight Returns. You wouldn't have Watchmen. You wouldn't have any of those projects because Dick was in charge of DC when they were doing the most creative, adventurous stuff. And one of the things Dick told me early on and taught me was, you have to. Your job as an editor is not to make people tell the story you want them to tell. Your job is to find people who have a story that you like and help them tell their story to the best of their ability. So have we reached a shift where the editor has pretty much become an account manager? Yeah. That's messed up, man. I know. That's pretty messed up. I know. It is, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And like I said, in Marvel, it's better. I mean, everybody's everybody's experience might vary. I mean, I probably have a little more clout than the, than the brand new kid or whatever, but that's because I've got 25 years of experience, and you kind of know what you're going to get if you hire me. Yeah. But by and large, uh, seriously, like, I'm not trying to... I'm honest as can be. I'm, I'm, and nobody will accuse me of, of, of brown nosing companies because I've said a lot of outrageous things over the years. But I think you're pretty safe too. I'm pretty, I think, sa yeah, you're pretty, pretty safe. safe. Nobody yeah. watches this. Yeah, I say, yeah. I but still, but, but 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 really, I feel like you know your experience might be a little different than mine. But by and large, the experience is they let you do. They yeah. they talk okay. to you about what you want to do, and they let you do what you want to do. Yeah. Well, because you were comparing to Marvel a lot, and Marvel gives yeah. you more creative freedom. So yeah. what's what's there that's missing? Like, is it the artist or the writer that kind of has to have something in their contract that's like, kind of leave me alone? That wouldn't even or, save you. Well, first of all, actually, nobody does that. The only guy who ever got that in comics that I know of is J. Michael Straczynski. Really? Yeah, and we can see how well that turned out. Okay. Um, uh, so you don't get that. Because, and, and again, no company's going to give you that because it's, a, because it's, it's Disney and it's Warner Brothers. They're not going to get. They're not going to let you. They're going to give you a hands-off clause in the contract. And I get that. I wouldn't. You know, if I were them, I wouldn't either. You know, you need. But what you don't want that. What you want is just an editor who is simpatico enough to get what you're doing and to talk with you. And if he's got a problem with stuff, and again, I don't. I, I can. I can do pretty much whatever I want. But I still appreciate it when my editor calls and says, "You know what? I'm not sure this scene worked for me, or I'm not sure this." was the right way to approach this if you think about this instead. Yeah. And as long as I'm working with an editor that I respect and who obviously respects me, then let's have that conversation, absolutely. Yeah. And on top of that, like talking about like team switching lineups and yeah. all these changes, going into the characters themselves, when you have the whole... Uh, because I, I just started thinking about the superhero and the sidekick. Yeah. At one point, because I... I'm a DC fan, yeah. and it drives me crazy that they have a crap load of sidekicks. Yeah. But at what point should should Nightwing just be Batman? Like, is there yeah. is there a world? Is there a future? Is there a time? Is there an anywhere nah. that you see just Bruce Wayne nah. is just over? Nah, nah. You know why? Because it's because they made billions of dollars off the movies. Yeah. They're not going to make that kind of permanent change with that character because they made so much money off the movies. The, I mean, dude, the the, the 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 Batman Arkham video game made any one of those video games makes more for DC than five years worth of Batman comics. But that's Batman, not Bruce Wayne. Still, but all right, all right, point taken. But everybody, you know, but all right, but the movies is the thing. Like that drives, it's always going to be Bruce Wayne. Well, how many changes are in the movies right now? How many times like are we going to see a movie where they keep changing up a character? Yeah, but everybody, How far, how but far away are we from getting the, the Hispanic kid from Ultimate Universe be Spider-Man in a movie? That would be awesome, but think about it. everybody in this room. If you asked everybody in this room, if you went out on the street and asked people, and just like random people, who Bat who Batman is, they tell you Bruce Wayne. So I don't know how you make that. I don't know how you make that change. I don't know how you make that progression to other characters. If it's something like Flash, you can do that, or at least we did. I mean, the thing, the one I like write, about writing Flash was that Wally West was the very first superhero sidekick to fulfill the promise. Mm -hmm. He's at, to graduate to, he's the first one to actually become the character, not a you know, different version, not like Robin becomes Nightwing, Speedy becomes, you know, Arsenal, but Kid Flash became Flash. Yeah. You know, it's just, that's a progression for those characters, and that's like a, that's an evolution for those characters, and DC very much, more than ever, wants them frozen exactly as the general public knows them, because that's what they want. And, uh, that I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So can I ask you, how does it work when, when it comes time to relaunch an origin? Yeah. Like how does that work? Like okay, like is there an actual time frame? Like is it like okay, every ten years do we got to redo an origin? Or 
No, it's no. just like whoever has the best idea for it's it. Whoever's the best idea. It's like you know we need to you know we need to recap. You know most people don't know this origin, or most people there's a new spin on it or something. It's just it's really there's no dictate that I can think of what comes it's down. Like the Iron Man thing with the movies coming out it makes no sense to add yeah. it, you know be a prisoner of the Vietnam War. Right, exactly. So know, let's update. so so let's do something that sort of updates and 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 changes things without doing massive changes. Yeah. There's a question I always bring up. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say always, but more more so than I'd like. When does the new 52 stop yeah. being the new? Uh, you got me. You know? Yeah. I, ask I mean, like Marvel day. now. I know. That's a present. That's present. Like, like, like obviously, I know. <laughs> Marvel now. Yes. I know. Okay. I don't know because I, I got to say it is not. It's not exactly a selling point. Right. So I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's just ego. It's just like you know we've created this brand, and so we are gonna. Prove to you that it's successful, whether we're going because we're gonna keep it's it going until here. Yeah. What do you think about the 3D covers? Yep. <laughs> oh, well, now that you're in now a retail, retail. Now that you're a retailer. Yeah. yeah now, I'm, now I'm a retailer at All Three Go Comics. Way to in jump Muncie, in Indiana. at this point. Exactly. Yeah. All Three Go, All Three Go Comics, Muncie, Indiana. Yeah. So, so my first week as a retailer is was the week I got to tell everybody who came into my store. I'm so we don't have enough Harley Quinn covers for you. I'm sorry. That but what sucks. have you heard from the grapevine? Like, what was it a logistics issue? Did someone just not figure out how much paper was going to be needed, or That's, what was actually going to be needed to make these things? The, I don't think the problem was that was supply and demand. I think it was just that they didn't do a very good job of explaining to us or, or communicating to us like how rare this stuff was going to be, and they certainly didn't do a good job of, of working with us as to what how they were going to allocate these books. Oh, so you're saying that they were these were always supposed to be exclusive covers? Well, I mean, they always... Because didn't you say that like it was going to be per order for the for the 3D covers? If you ordered one, you're going to get one? That was the original intent. That was the original intent. For subscribers. Like, right. If they, you know, they fill out the previews or however your right. store does it, you wanted a 3D cover, you pre-ordered it in advance. Right, right. You were supposed to get it. Right. What they said was, look, we're only going to print as many as you order, so right. order big, but still, please order. Yeah. And then that didn't happen yeah, because we didn't get nearly so enough. Yeah way too much yeah so how are you dealing with this with, with uh, your customers are you going cover price are you making yeah, them yeah. like it yeah you're going yeah, cover I'm, not, price? I'm not one of those guys who's like oh ten dollars on opening day no, that's that's Dear, like, Dear is not yeah, I don't yeah, make well he doesn't run a store yeah. he doesn't run, run like he, well, he manages it yeah, yeah but I just I, I'm I'm a big fan of you know it should be cover price I, we just have to tell people we've had to tell a few people like we're really sorry but they luckily they get it like they, they understand it's not our fault it's DC's fault We'll try to make it up to them whenever we can. We're keeping an eye out for anything that might be out there. I don't know. You know we'll, it's, it's tough. Yeah. You guys switch gears a little bit. We're talking yeah. about comics. I want to talk about movies real quick. I don't know yeah. if you've seen the announcement. Last, I think it was last night. It was just announced Justin Bieber has a copy of the Batman Superman movie. Wait, wait. Do you know who Justin Bieber is? Everybody, unfortunately, knows who Justin Bieber is. I was just making Bieber sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah he, uh, I read the article to them on the right here this morning. Yeah. Um, he tweeted, tweeted whatever, uh, yeah. a picture of him holding the script. Oh, and sweet. at first it looks kind of photoshopped, yeah. but then there was other uh, news outlets who went and confirmed that the photo was real because Warner Brothers is considering bringing him in for the role of Robin. Ooh. You know, Ouch. Nothing surprises me anymore. Nothing surprises me anymore. Nothing. Why can't he just be dead reporter number three? <laughs> yeah. He could be an Easter egg, like, where's Justin Bieber? Under that tower. Exactly. <laughs> you know, there you and go. Dude, nothing, look, on the one hand, nothing surprises me. And even and when you say that, my eyes roll back in my head. On the other hand, look, one movie is not going to ruin the franchise. True. And, I, and again, I was, a, I was a, you, you were too young to remember, but I was at ground zero when people announced Michael Keaton as Batman, and you would have thought the world was going to end. If the internet had existed, then it would have ripped him The random out. stabbing? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It would have yeah. been you know people you know, sitting I'm there and fighting. I'm actually glad you said that one movie yeah. doesn't break a franchise, because our cameraman over yeah. there yeah. is an avid hater of the Man of Steel movie. Yes, me too. I was just going to ask you how yeah. you felt about that. I, well, let me rephrase it. I'm not an avid hater of the movie. I may have a hater of the last 30 minutes of the movie. Oh, well, like because I, he killed? That's a real problem. Is that, is, that, is that because he killed? Yeah, if anybody's going to answer this question, whether it's that's good a big, or bad, I want him to answer That's, that's a big problem. You know, I'm sorry, I don't see that as a problem. I see I it as don't. a huge problem. Okay, okay oh, why? Why do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Be quiet, cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear this. There's a couple of reasons. One is this. You don't get... It's not. It's not just the killing. It's also all the destruction porn before that. It's also uh, the fact that. It's also, wait, wait, no, let me finish. Because that whole lead up to it's. It's not just that. It's that whole. You didn't. You didn't earn the killing because you didn't show me even once. 
after the oil rig fire like two hours ago that Superman is interested in saving or helping anybody if their name isn't in the credits. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't save, he doesn't, he doesn't, you don't, you don't, first of all, Ghost Dad tells him for an hour and a half, you will, you will, you will, you will raise them, you will, they will, they, you will teach them, you will, That's they will, 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 you will, they will, you will lift them up, you will, you will, and, and that's crap because it doesn't happen. Like, he, he doesn't inspire them, he doesn't lift them up, he doesn't do anything. He, he doesn't do, at first of all, he doesn't do anything that no, that somebody else doesn't tell him to do. Well, that's just it. We're yeah. given a character yeah. that's not disciplined. He, yeah. he he was he was pretty much. I didn't to, buy the no, ticket no, no, no. to read su- to see Superboy hey, the movie. That was the story. The yeah. story was you you hide yourself. You're going to be a monster. Don't don't use your powers. So he finally he gets to use the powers. Right, I get that. But yeah. he doesn't know what how to use them. He doesn't know he's supposed to go around and save lives. If anything, the greatest thing done in the movie is that the the to me the most craziest deus ex machina in all of comic books yeah. is that he has the Phantom Zone. I right. love that that was taken away from him. I'm not saying that. On top of that, yeah. stack on top of that, those two things. You're going to lose that, the fight, but go ahead. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> that this isn't some 1980s cartoon where like right. he could he could shoot Zod into space or through a wormhole, and Zod is going to be like, I'll get you back. No, he didn't That have, doesn't exist. He didn't have to do that. I'll tell you also, exactly, I'll on top tell you exactly of that, Zod, 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 Zod was born and bred right. to, to protect Krypton. Right, so he that, so that he was just, his sole purpose. Right. So that's he's programmed and right. embedded in so now every he, single so part now of his he's, DNA. So now, he, now he's going to he doesn't kill have that. So now he's going to kill the only thing left of Krypton. That's it. Why? Why? He doesn't know how to use it. He he's he doesn't know how to take take out and recreate no, I mean Zod, it. No, I mean he doesn't Zod, know how to do Zod. it. Zod's whole you said it exactly. Zod's entire reason for existence is the preservation of all things Kryptonian. Yes. yes. So, so, yes. So, yes. He, so yes. he is yes. going to destroy the thing that pretty much tried to destroy Krypton. That didn't make any that's, sense No, that's what Superman did. He he, oh, he chose to be human. Well, he yeah, he but, made a choice. But Superman also, yeah. Was, he's a traitor. A soldier dealing with a traitor. Well, he's also, he also, well, he's completely a traitor because he also said Krypton had its chance and then he incinerated a bunch of embryos. So nice going, Superman. Um, I mean, it's not just Zod he kills. He kills, he kills an entire Kryptonian spaceship full of Kryptonian embryos. Nice going, but so but but I don't follow this. That if Zod's entire makeup is to preserve all things Kryptonian, and the only thing left is Kal El, and Kal El is not going to work with them. He's not going to be willing to work with Zod. They're not going to work together. They're not. They hate each other. Okay. And on top of that, you have a soldier. You have a a, a legal authority dealing with a known traitor. All right. So all right. All right. So that's Zod. I still don't. I still don't get why it's cool that Superman killed him. I just. I just said it. No, 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 I, just no. Said it. I just said it. Not I only. Said not it. only. Here's the. For, not only are there like six ways to get out of that, but it's not even. The question is not what would you have done in that situation. Okay, you know what? I want Mark Wade right now yeah. to write the thirty minutes of Superman. Those last thirty minutes. Shoot it. Your thirty thir- minutes. Your thirty minutes. Go ahead. Okay, here's your thirty minutes. Okay. You can do most of the same stuff as long as Superman is trying desperately and succeeding to save people from Zod's insane rampage as entire buildings are collapsing. And he's and he's working hard and he's getting his ass kicked because he's saving people. And Zod is in it, it, Zod starts to pick up on that. Oh, this is where I can really kick your ass because you're busy saving these earthlings so that means I can get the drop on you every time. So first off, I need to see Superman saving people from Zod. But that's classic Superman. That's not this. What, that's not what this Superman why would you, was. Wait, 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 wait. You do, in, in a sense, though, is I'm he, not backtracking he's a on human how being. I feel about he's, movie, he's, No, no, it's okay. Okay, go ahead. The classic Superman. Well, even if you, you know, don't want the point. class, even if you to don't want point. the classic Superman, you want a character that you can root for. You want a character that you can admire. Our job is not to bring Superman down to our level. Superman is built to inspire us to come up to his level. It's all, it is basic human nature. Go look at the Boston, go look at the Boston Marathon bombing. What's the first thing that people did? They will rush to the side of the blast to help other people. That's what people do, man. They, at, at, on 9-11, first responders were first in. That's human response. Not everybody's going to feel that way, but I expect Superman to feel that way, if, if anybody's going to feel that way, and you go and you help people. How would you have felt if they showed more of the, the human reaction, more as, as opposed to just showing Perry yeah, I know. Trying to help out his employees. I know. I know. I, know. I, know. I, know. I know. this Isn't paper. Jenna Olson? Or Jenna, something never, like that. I never even said it. I, I don't know. There's only four people in Metropolis. Because anyway. I, I could actually oh, I think of, like, when I think of movies like uh, Transformers, yeah. you're there to see giant robots, but well, they even, not. they have, At like, some, some, yeah, that's more like some a 30% reaction. human. But, so so let, me finish, let me finish the writing this ending for you. So first off, you do that. I need you to show me more than just one family at a subway station. Um, 
and, and then here's what you do. Superman has already punched him into space once. You punch him into space. And you punch him again. And you punch him again. And you're taking him past Venus. And you're taking him past Mars. And you're hitting him with all you've got. And the further he gets away from Earth's yellow sun, Kal-El has been bathed in this stuff for, for years and years and years. He's still got the, But General Zod's dose of yellow of sun energy is much, much less than Kal-El's. He's going to peter out first. Then you take him back to her. I count on that with the fact that Zod is a better fighter. Zod is a better fighter, but I'm sorry. It's it's it, it is to me. It is hokey that you could just punch him into space. Zod's gonna punch you back. He'll probably even grab you. He'll probably, probably even try to break your arm. About an alien superhero. You know this is not They're a, alien. I know. You know this is not a documentary, right? No, it's <laughs> not. It's not. But we are watching an action movie. He was a better fighter. And everything was already defined in the movie. I know, but here's the thing. It's just also I need Superman to win. I need Superman to to. Well, here, do you think that maybe because of his sans emotion for the first movie, yeah. maybe in the sequel they'll play upon this, well, maybe, you know, I should have saved these people, I can do better, maybe, and maybe help him become the I hope so, I hope so, but man, I don't, you know, but that's, that's, that's closing the barn door after the horse is left, because if this movie hadn't mm -hmm. been successful, mm -hmm. and there could have been every chance that it wasn't, then, then, then we're stuck with a Superman who was just a callous jerk. Right. I mean, look. I didn't, like I said, I didn't buy the ticket. You didn't invite, advertise the movie as Superboy, mm -hmm. who's going to grow up to be Superman. You advertise it as Superman. And so, look, I get that, I get that it was a hard decision. And I get that it's a more realistic decision to have him have to decide whether to kill this guy or not. Would but, he kill him as Superman too? No, no, he trapped him in no. tin, in tin foil. What was, what was the one carrying? No, no, he, 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 he still had the pushed him off. And you see him, yeah. and first off, I mean, first off, you don't you don't see what happens to him. You don't you don't know. It's open to interpretation. Secondly, it's a lot more cartoon violence than it ever was in that movie. I mean, there's you, you contrast the level of intensity and violence and actual like you know, in that to Superman two. Superman two is a cartoon. And thirdly, as it was filmed, it was filmed with there's a there's a scene with them being arrested. Mm -hmm. And that's that. Now the the director who came on afterwards, who put it together after Donner, took that scene out. But I'm just saying that was not the intent of the screenwriters. It was not the intent to show Superman's a killer. Secondly, secondly, we all know killing is wrong. Right. I mean, yes, there are mitigating circumstances. Unless you're yes, a hitman. Yes, you're exactly. Yes, there are Punisher. Yes, there are so yes Wolverine. In, soldier, <laughs> soldiers, policemen doing their job. I get that, but on a basic human fundamental level murder is wrong yeah killing is wrong and i don't that is not something that is not a victory that we should aspire to superman didn't win he just outlasted in that sense i'm like geez there's no so this, this is something that we talked about uh when we were talking about the man of steel when it first came out but maybe we could get your point of view on this yeah. at what point are these movies just getting too real Oh man! Because even even you told me you told me right now like yeah. like like well and it, being a little too realistic. A little but, too yeah, realistic. But, yeah. Okay, but that's what these movies are gearing toward. Right. So I at know. what point do we just gotta kind of like turn the knob down? I don't know. I mean, it, it's I think Marvel does a better job of it. Again, I, I'm not to be a Marvel apologist, but again, yes, there was a lot of destruction in Avengers, but you were also watching Captain America and the other heroes deal with mm -hmm. other people, like deal with that, and also it wasn't. At least they were trying to do something to stop it. They weren't just, they weren't on the other side of the world hitting something in the Indian Ocean. Um, it's it just, you know, all that stuff, you're right, we are getting to the point where every movie ends with 30 minutes of destruction porn, and it is too much. I don't know. You just become numb to it after a while. Um, I don't know. Let's hope that Ant Man doesn't, you know, fall Ant prey to that. You know, Ant Man get, get Ant Man could be the greatest killer in the entire with, world after, if you th after 30 minutes of yeah. destruction. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right, man, guys. Uh, we got a little heated toward the end. Yeah. yeah. You, Mark is gonna take out the, the nuts. Of the show. That's what he's That's reaching it. for. He's Mark, got. He's got the nuts. Kids, on. Murder is wrong. Apparently, unless you're Superman. Also, <laughs> <laughs> also don't. T also, this is the other thing. Like, don't, don't make a story about what Superman would do in a real world situation. That's not what Superman's built for. Superman is not built for that. Superman's not built to fail the Kobayashi Maru. Okay, Superman was built 
and created to do impossible things. Good uh, Star Trek reference there. Anyway, but he's yeah. completely, I mean, from yeah. the moment we ever, I mean, literally the moment we ever first saw him in, in American history, he's lifting a car over his head Very and true. he's bashing into the wall and nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Yeah. He's built to do things that we can't do. And anytime you're telling a Superman story and somewhere in there he doesn't do something impossible, then your Superman story is broken. Mm -hmm. I pause it. There you go. Cool. All right. Well, Rainbows. Rainbows. Yeah. The more you know. <laughs> All right, thanks, All right. guys. I appreciate it. Thanks All for right, having stick me. stick around as we start to tour the rest of the convention. Thank you very much, you Mark. You bet. My pleasure. Junior. Thanks, Mark. Thank Always you, sir. a pleasure. Absolutely. Hey everyone, we're here with the main man, Mark Rakeup, the creator of these beautiful Batmans. Would you call yourself the creator or how would you, what's, oh, what's your official title here? The builder. The builder, the builder of right. Batman mm -hmm. stuff. Well, the Batmobiles. This is your first baby right here. It this sure is. is. The um, Bat One. Dave, yeah, this is Bat One. And this is one that I built back when I was a 17 year old teenager. A uh, crazy kid who had no auto body experience, had no tools whatsoever, but I had willpower. Uh, wait, wait. Crazy kid? Crazy kids. Builds a Batmobile. Builds a Batmobile. I think that's pretty cool. Crazy she, kids, I know, do crazy things. You have ingenuity when you're crazy. Okay. Well, there are five, five of us crazy teenagers. We tore apart an old 1974 Monte Carlo, and we built our very first Batmobile using all the wrong materials. We used wood. We used steel. We used uh, foam, whatever we could get a hold of. And we're putting this thing together by, by sheer willpower, as I said. We were too naive to know we couldn't do it, so we did. All right. Hey. Good, your willpower. Uh, what do you want to tell us about how you got the, you got your license to do these, like you're the only ones that could do the 66, you and your group, fiber, fiberglass freaks. Fiberglass freaks, right. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in 2007, DC Comics sent a spy to our shop pretending to be a customer, and that got the ball rolling. They a secret just, shopper. And uh, a secret shopper, and this guy disappeared on me, so it was kind of a weird thing. Most Batmobile buyers that are tire kickers, they fade away, but this guy disappeared. And I knew there was something up with that. Well, years later, when they actually came up with the final contract, it took three years of negotiations to make this happen. And when they did, uh, I, I knew exactly who it was when they admitted that they sent a spy to the shop. The only one, the only nice. a tire kicker that disappeared on me. <laughs> nice. So what... Are there any legalities if somebody else spills a 66 Batmobile? Like, like what happens there? Yeah. What goes on? Yeah, we're the only ones that are licensed, and um, yeah, the others are black market cars. We'll kind of leave it at that. So wait, so. if we see any other ones at the convention, that's the black market of Batmobiles? Yes. They're pretty blatant about it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but yeah, we are officially licensed. We've been building them uh, as officially licensed vehicles for three years. We've got cars all over the world. It's been fantastic. We've got one in England. We have one in Italy, one going to Australia, and we also have uh, two in Canada. Business is booming for the 66 Batmobile. And you have a, few, uh, a couple other ones here that we're about to tour. Junior's in here right now playing with these buttons. Can you tell us about some of the special features in here? On this particular car, we didn't have a lot of features because this was back when I was 17 building this one. But uh, if we turn the key counterclockwise, <laughs> if we turn the key right here, uh, turn that counterclockwise, and we flip the beacon switch that's to the right there, down one, down one, down, down. It's labeled beacon. Yeah, all, 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 of the, uh, all the switches and buttons in a Batmobile are labeled, of course, including the emergency bat turn lever to turn the car 180 degrees around. But uh, this is one of many, many of the features that the car does have, including, yeah, including the bat beam. Uh, we'll show off some of the other features, some of the same features on, on the finished car, the, the nice newer car that we have. But, uh, but it, was, it was really a unique experience building this one. As I say, it was, all, it was definitely willpower because there's well, nothing No else. experience, no right. previous experience. You know, I thought for sure it would only take, uh, you know, probably a, about three months to build the thing, and it took three summers. So you were drunk when you made the decision. No, <laughs> no, no, I can't, I don't have that excuse. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, it was just a blast. What I need, what we were doing was we were making a, a Batman fan film in college, oh, and I needed the ultimate prop. So necessity is the mother of invention. So here oh, comes the Batmobile. 
So a, a refrigerator, <laughs> cardboard box, and cutout just wasn't enough. It was not going to satisfy me, no. Thanks so, for Amy Heim. All right, let's move on over to some of the other cars. You bet. Autos, people. All right, Mark, we're standing next to the Futura. What, what is this? What is this beaten up, non-painted well, this, shell? This, this is just a sculpture. It was sculpted by the famous guy, uh, Marty Martino, and he's, he makes all kinds of uh, concept car replicas. Okay. So the, the Futura, the 1955 Lincoln Futura, was a concept car. There was only one ever made, and that's what became the Batmobile. Well, George Bears converted the one and only into the Batmobile, so now there was no Futura. Well, Marty Martino took it upon himself to make this fantastic sculpture. He got in touch with Ford, got all kinds of photos, and was able to make a sculpture using a lofting principle. They're bulkheads about every foot oh, okay. along this. And he made this beautiful sculpture. And then after he popped molds of it, he couldn't bring himself to destroy this work of art. Most bucks are destroyed. Oh, no, after, he, he after went, made it, put right? so much into it. But he let it set out in the woods for about 12 years. So it was deteriorating. The rear end was falling off. It was, it was really in bad shape. So it was either throw it away or sell it. So he sold it. I bought it on eBay. You know how they say you can buy anything on eBay? <laughs> they really do mean it. Deal. Here it is. And $2,125 later, my business partner and I uh, drove down to uh, Virginia to go pick this thing up. And we had to tarp it heavily tarp it and put straps all the way around it because pieces were falling off of it literally as we were driving along Like we're talking about huge cracks, huge like, like gigantic pieces missing out. Right. So, so how does this become a Batmobile? Well, from this, we fixed it up, fixed all those giant gaping cracks like the ones that you can see here on the, the yeah, rear Yeah, those of the are wing. pretty serious. Those are all taken care of. Body worked it, statue primed it, cracks. and then we cast a Futura mold. Then from the Futura mold, I cast a Futura body in fiberglass. Okay. And then, just like George Barris did to the, the actual metal Futura that became the Batmobile, I modified that fiberglass Futura body into the Batmobile. I took high-res pictures of the number one car, and I blew them up using an opaque projector right onto the sides of the fiberglass body, traced, literally traced right off of it, We're using a marker, a Sharpie, to be able to get the exact shaping right. So closing off the headlight buckets, doing the scallops on the wings, bringing the wings onto the doors, extending the hood scoop down so you didn't the didn't have nose. CAD is what you're telling me. No. You didn't have CAD. <laughs> oh, it <laughs> was really high here. tech. <laughs> yeah, really high tech. You went into a school, borrowed the projector. Uh, we had this, one, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, so it was a crazy amount of work. It took three months to do all of that and then cast the mold. Wow. And then we cast the f uh, fiberglass body. And it took a, about eight months after that to make the first Batmobile, the pro Batmobile. And then we popped new molds of that one. And that's what those are the molds that are being used today to cast our current Batmobiles. Yeah, and Mark has a pro right over here. And that's where we're headed. Follow us. All right, Mark, this is the finished product, right? This is what gets right. sent out. This is what people buy. Tell us what we got here. This is our 15th Batmobile. It is on loan from a customer. And uh, this oh, is what we do. Thanks, guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that nice of him? Uh, yeah. And uh, this is uh, this is a gloss black paint job, as you can see, perfectly smooth compared yeah. to Bat 1. This is the kind of work that we produce out of our own molds. It's a 22-piece mold to make a Batmobile. And it takes about six to eight months to build each car. We build them on Lincoln Town Car chassis that are completely rebuilt. So we sandblast and powder coat the frame. We rebuild it with brand new suspension, steering, and brakes. And that's what puts uh, that's what gives the base of the car. And then the, the body is all fiberglass, and the rest is all us. Do you have one that you drive around, Tom? Uh, I don't, uh, except for that one. That's, that's you actually drive that one around? I do drive that, the that one. I still drive it around. Yeah. When do you take that down to Chicago? Because oh, I would I, like to drive around with you. I drove you. this I'm one to gonna... Chicago. Yeah? I drove it to Chicago Comic Con, about a three and a half hour drive. Oh, in fantastic. the Batmobile. It was you make awesome. A... There I was on the Dan Ryan. We have six lanes of traffic, right? And people yeah. are honking. They're opening up their van doors, taking pictures. Oh, it was probably great gets crazy, stuff. man. You actually make different editions of this? Is there like a pro edition? Uh, can you tell us like right. different different types? There are four different models of the Batmobile okay. that we sell. The first one is the flocked Batmobile, just like what Barris put out in the late uh, the late 60s and early 70s with the velvety finish. Yeah. Yeah, most people think that it's really goofy and really dumb, but every once in a while you get somebody that gets really excited because it, that's their Batmobile. And they that's, need some velvet. That's their first one. So that's our introductory one at $79,999. Then the next one is the standard edition which is the same car only it has a gloss black paint job on it 
then the luxury edition, the limited edition, has all the bells and whistles. So the flamethrower works out the back, the roll top dashboard works. Not a jet engine. As bat I bat beam out. antenna, Dave, and all of these things going on. And then the premier edition is the really souped up one. It has a 525 horsepower motor, has a monster transmission in it, uh, curry rear end, and it also uh, has GPS and satellite radio and air conditioning which is interesting in an open cockpit car, but it works. Okay, now, you sell these to celebrities. Have you ever gotten any special requests, any special add-ons, like a jet engine? <laughs> we have lots of special requests for parts What's on the our crazy, Any crazy ones? Or yeah, uh, the, the confetti cannons on our last car that we shipped out to Arizona, bat-shaped confetti fires out the triple rocket tubes on the rear deck. That should be standard. Uh, it should be. Yeah. Uh, and also out of the trunk, he wanted to have the bat signal large enough to flash onto the side of a building. Who got that? That actually, that sounds pretty cool. And that was neat. That was great. Um, and what else Can did he want? Can you name the celebrities at all? Is it all He's like not a, ce a celebrity as such, um, but uh, he does a, kind of a Make-A-Wish Foundation. He works very closely with Batman. That's a good call. Bat the Wayne signal. Foundation. <laughs> That's a good call. Anything else? Like any other crazy? Um, let's see. He wanted fuel injection. So that was the first time doing that on a car. So a lot more wiring involved um, with the fuel injection When it comes car. to the parts and actually shaping the body, like what is probably like your biggest challenge out of producing these Batmobiles? Really, it's getting it flat because for the paint job that Ed Merrill does on these uh, beautiful cars, it takes a long time to get these long, long, long panels flat, especially the fins, the tops and the sides of the fins. It's a, a lot of hand sanding using a long sanding block, and you just man, you, a lot of man hours. Mm -hmm. A lot of man hours. More than fifteen hundred man hours for each car. So inside That's the car right now, we got Kyle, our editor, and then we got Junior, our co-host. They want to flip buttons. Can okay. you go over there and show right. the people? All right, we're going to turn on the the beacon light. <laughs> Uh, we're going to turn the increase output to raise the bat beam antenna. Capable of cutting through 18 inches of steel or three feet of concrete, at least, at least on the TV show anyway. Now, in front, in front of the center console here, on the leading edge, there are two toggle switches. There's a left toggle switch. Go ahead and hold it up. Uh, down on that. On down the center console there in between the seats. There you go. That switch right there. Hold that up. This is the actuator that operates the hood actuator. See, all this stuff was science fiction back in 66. They had to use wires to make all this happen. We can do it for real because of these actuators right here. We have an LCD screen on the dash. We have a DVD player. We have a, a rear view camera. All this stuff was done with special effects back in those days. And go ahead and bring it back down. How's that for fun? And there are others, uh, other gadgets as well, like the Robin the Boy hostage finder or the detectoscope, <laughs> as we like to call it. Uh, that's a lot of fun. The, there's a five light flasher on the dash top, uh, gear shift indicator lights that uh, operate, of course, when it's, be, uh, when it's in gear, turn indicator lights that are operated from pods. There are switches on the actual steering wheel, just like the Batmobile had. Uh, uh, sure, yeah, just like that, and like that. Ooh, pretty cool. Uh, and it's functional. They're functional headlights, they're functional park clamps, they're functional turn signals, brake lights, so they can be registered. We've had them registered, I don't know, in probably 20 of the states uh, so far. They've been registered in Canada and England and also in Italy. So, so far, so good. Well, Mark, thank you very much, man. This is Absolutely. all really great stuff that you showed us today. And now we're actually going to have you on our next segment, the Collector's Corner, where Mark's going to actually show us some of his own personal items along with Kerry the Camera Guy. Fantastic. Although, uh, yeah, we have to get out of here before we just steal one of these. Hey, guys, welcome to another edition of the collector's case got my buddy mark here who builds batmobiles and, is he, and he is sharing his Batmo, bleh, his batman collection so how did you get started doing the, the batman stuff well i started really with the the corgi batmobile the miniature car and then from there i went into magos 
And Carrie, I absolutely fell in love with the Makos. Uh, My favorite, right? Them for Christmas. And uh, yeah, Batman with the removable cowl. We had Robin also with the removable mask. And then uh, later editions, we included Batgirl. Then we had the Penguin and the Joker and now, the did you have? Did you have the, uh, the Batcave and all that I other stuff? I sure did. In nice. fact, it's right here. Wow. The Mago Batcave is right there, so we, we might pull that out in a moment, too. Yep. <laughs> but um, we got the Mago Batmobile here. I'll go ahead and open sure. this up and pull this out. And you know, my I accuracy, I'm an accuracy nut, and right. I knew that the stickers weren't right. So even as a kid, I was pulling off the stickers and uh, getting ready to put on a red electrical tape. That's how I was going to fix the inaccuracy problems. And I was always trying to figure out, how do I put windshields on this? And these are still the ones from your childhood. These they are still sure yours. Yeah, and you, just, you didn't blow them up. No. no. <laughs> you know, I tried to take care of care of my toys, and um, it's so most, awesome. Uh, a lot of the older vintage toys that you see are the ones that I, I had as a child, like the uh, Batcopter over here as well. And then over the years, people have. Uh, thought of me for Christmas for some reason and birthdays and nice. have donated these items. Like I've got a can of SpaghettiOs I think I, over there. I saw that Batman one good over there, right? Yeah, uh, people will come up to me all the time and uh, be asking for uh, and, and donating these kinds of items. It's terrific. Now, it's really neat to see what's going on in the uh, model kits today. These, right. And that was scanned right off of the number one car. Same with the 1 18th scale. Uh, Hot Wheels Batmobile also laser scanned right off the number now one did you, Now, do you have the new one that just came out the, uh, from the 1966, the, the action figures? and the, I have the, the figures. The car hasn't been available around here yet, so okay. as soon as it is, I will certainly be adding that to the collection as well. Now, is the 1966, obviously, because you build them, is that your favorite, or would you be like, if I could build the Tumblr, or if I could build, I'd be all over that? Well, yeah, the 66, it, it, it's where my heart is. Right. Because it carry the graceful lines of that car are just beautiful. So I like it not only as a Batman fan and not only as a builder, but I like it just from an artistic standpoint. Uh, those bubble windshields are so striking that it really is the reason why I like that car. Is, the features are so great. Uh, the 89 car is also very striking, and I like it and appreciate what Anton first did and Tim Burton did in the 89 Batman movie. The other vehicles are neat. But they're not. They're, my heart just isn't in them as much. Right. Uh, the the tumbler is awesome. I think it's a fantastic vehicle. Uh, and uh, but I, I'm not much on the George Clooney uh, 33 foot long car. That, that one's okay. Now not for me. You ha I have you have these display cases that you have mm -hmm. for this. When you display them at home, are you are they how how's your setup there? Do you have them in cases like this, or do you have? They're uh, in, glass cases there? They're in my office at the shop, at the fiberglass okay. shop. And they're on display in different uh, different configurations there for people to be able to see. Now, so. I, now another question, because I, I'm a little bit of a car guy, yep. I have to ask, because you did the Batman stuff, okay? What about like the um, the weirdo stuff? Did you ever consider doing uh, the weirdos or the hot, or the um, uh, rat fink stuff or, <laughs> or Hot Wheels? Because I mean, once again, if, if you have the talent to mm -hmm. do these cars, I'd be like, you know what, I've got the shop, man, I'm building a Hot Wheel, or I'm building the, uh, you know, the Rat Fink stuff or something like that. But I, I like that stuff. I like the, those kind of hot rods. Have you ever done that, or is that anything that you collect? Or I did that collect kind of it. Okay. I did collect it, and okay. I appreciate the art very, very much. And if a customer wants to, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Uh, I, I might be we, on that list. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah, we're so busy with orders that for me to do something on spec or something just for fun, I don't really have that kind of time. Right. We've got 10 people on the payroll, and this is what we do for a living every single week. So the volume's uh, that high? Yes. Uh -huh. We're building four cars right now. Okay. So if that gives you any indication. So, so your shop is also your your, uh, your collector's uh, right. thing. Cool. Uh, yes. My wife and I spend a lot of time there, unfortunately. <laughs> nice. So let's, uh, I guess, no, wander on down here. Just a little bit. Yeah, I, I have to show can... this. Hold on. Junior Capan, you mind if I mm -hmm. show this? Because this, this is mm -hmm. like the awesome of awesome. The Batcave, guys, in the box. Dig it. How cool is that? Then over here we have uh, the 66 LP. Is that the story one or is that just the... Uh... It, yeah, it's the story one. It has a, a dialogue from the actual show uh, on it as well. So it has both music and dialogue bits from it. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it has a really nice shot of the Batmobile too. So for some reason I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I, now, are you a Batman fan first or are you a Batmobile fan? I, I, both. I mean, okay, so both. okay, so you fell in love with both. It wasn't just right. like I love the car and then mm -hmm. everything goes with it. It was a 
It was a mutual. Yeah, everything about the 66 show I fell in love with. Okay. So the color, the action, the music, uh, the daring do, everything about it, but especially with the car, because that, that was part of the, a large part of the fun. Okay, cool. All right, this is case number two. So what, what are you showing here? This is pretty cool. Well, I, Carrie, I got this as a Christmas gift, and I thought it was just a goofball idea, but it was really cold on one of my trips in the <laughs> Batmobile to Indianapolis uh, from Logansport, about a two-hour yeah, drive. Top. And this really helped out on a Thanksgiving weekend. That's awesome. <laughs> it was now, great. I have, when you've ever driven that Batmobile, I have to ask, mm -hmm. have you ever tossed a costume on and said, okay, I'm going all out? Many times. <laughs> Uh, many times. I, I've done lots of birthday parties and, and things like that. That was about 50 pounds ago. But, okay. Uh, but but no, you know um, what? It's the 1966 Batman. You could dress. It's, it's still okay. A little too but much what? Adam yeah. West. Yep. <laughs> nice. And I also saw over here you have an old Viewmaster. Oh, that's disc. one of my favorites. Uh, that was another one from my youth that I really, really appreciated. So that was that's still that was Vintage. the original. Mm -hmm. Do you have the Viewmaster stuff? I still do. Nice. We keep all of that. Um, but yeah, we we also have some of the other items. My my wife collects Barbies. Jill, okay. Uh, and Jill and I met because of the Batmobile, by the way. Perfect. We were working you on. You knew she Bat was a keeper one. right there. Yeah. Here was my pickup line. I could use some help working on the car. She said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so 26 years of marriage later, here we are building Great. Batmobiles for a living. Great. Uh, but yeah, the lots of toys and things because we're both collectors, and that's a, that's a major part of it. But we've got a lot of great friends that uh, that, are, that contribute items to it as well. Um, some of the other items, like we've got a patch down here, which is fun. Uh, the chocolates. I like the, uh, from the Batmobile parking. Right. The parking permits. Uh, how about the, the little toy Batman here? I hear he's pretty valuable. Which one is he? The, straight down from my finger here. Well, yeah, which guy is? I'm yeah, not familiar I, with what he is. And I, I don't know either. I just keep hearing from people that see it. They all go bananas for it. So. Okay, and then Hot Wheels reissued. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have the Corgi in here. No. Is it the Corgi or, Cor Corgi or Corgi? I'm not sure which, I'm not but sure it is either. the coolest Batmobile ever. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute. Right. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right, Mark, table three. Got some cool stuff here. I love it. Got to tell you, I love it. Why don't you tell everyone what that is, man? This is the Corgi or Corgi Batmobile. This is one from my youth, and uh, it's, it was the car that I used to design my very first Batmobile, the full-scale version. We only had five photos and this toy to go from, and that was it. And uh, unlike most of the kids, no, I didn't blow it up. I was going to say, I had to, it took me years to find one in good shape and replace. And does that have the missiles and all the, the I'm gizmos? I'm missing, missing the missiles in the beacon cage. Unfortunately, okay. over the years, those became lost, as most people's did. Chain cutter but works? I still have the box, and the chain cutter still works, and the flame still moves in and out the back of it. So that's all that's good. That's so awesome. And I uh, wanted to also show you something else that was really cool. This is something my wife, Jill, found for me for my birthday. Uh, this is Shakespeare, the Shakespeare bust, of course, from the TV show, Concealed What? It concealed the switch to access the bat cave through the bat poles, right? So this is actually a hinged miniature version in 1-6 scale. So it has a lot of sentimental value to me because of Jill's collection and, and uh, our devotion to each other. Then, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the bat boat. Ah. This Very, is the, that, now, that was part of the Corgi line, correct? Mm -hmm. That was the same same line as the Batmobile. It sure was, you bet. And I was playing with this as a kid, a youngster, back in probably 72. I would have been about seven years old. I dug up a hole in my backyard. I filled it with water, and I put the bat boat in it. Well, Mom called for supper, so I went inside. Dad comes home, and guess what my dad does? The boat apparently had sunk, so he didn't know it was there. He, he buries buries the entire yeah. boat in the hole in dirt. And I visit about 15 years later because my dad's selling the property. And guess what I see? Peeking out of the ground, just a little bit of orange, about like that, just peeking out of the ground. I'm going to, no way. I start digging, and sure enough, it's my bat boat. So you did find a buried treasure. 15 years later, buried treasure. Now, the question That's I have right. is, so why didn't you go back out that night and go, Dad, and start digging it back up after you buried your boat? I didn't realize that it was gone. <laughs> I didn't okay. realize it was missing. I figured he would have put it someplace. So I don't remember what, exactly. So how cool was that, really though, to, to, to go back and just find that thing? <laughs> it was stick awesome. Up? It was awesome. It was just a fantastic moment, that's for sure. Awesome. We've been interviewed in lots of magazines and lots of TV shows. Okay. Uh, so we've been uh, we'll all over the place. some of those off so people can kind of sure. get an idea. We've been in, uh, you know, Motor Trend Classic. We're in FHM. 
DuPont Registry, Auto Build, uh, magazines over in uh, Europe. We're, okay. we're big in Russia, apparently. We're big in the uh, Australia. See, I was waiting for you to say we're huge in Japan, because that would just make me laugh. And uh, <laughs> we've been on television in Germany, okay. in Japan. Now, do you, yep. do you travel for, have you traveled because of the, making the band wheels? Have they said, hey, yep. you know what, C come out to Japan, come out to Germany, come out and, and talk about your product? We've been to England because of it. Nice. Yeah. Now, a lot of people ask me, they say, have any of the celebrities from the TV show seen one of your cars? Okay. What do you think? Nice. Now, do they, do they wig out, too? Do they go, dude, oh, this yeah. is the coolest? Yeah. Has that, have any of them bought one? Not yet. Not yet. Adam West doesn't have a Batmobile. He does not, uh, but uh, Burt Ward and his agent contacted me one time, okay. so maybe that'll See, happen not, someday. See, now that's, that's sticking to Batman. Robin cruising right. by uh -huh. in the Batmobile. That's awesome. So let's take a look at some of the names on here, see if you recognize any of these. Adam West, Lee, Burt Lee Ward, Merriweather. Leah Merriweather, wow. Yvonne Craig, Julie Newmar, and Malachi Throne, who played False Face. Okay. And what about um, Egghead? Um, unfortunately, he's uh, passed Price. away. You know, Price. The others, unfortunately, have passed away. But this was you said a, Julie Newmar this was, was on a there? blast. Yep. Okay. And then we were also in Auto Enthusiast magazine in, with a six-page article. This thing was insane and wonderful. Brad uh, Bowling, who is a NASCAR photographer, okay. took all of these beautiful pictures of the car that you see now here. That's a, now that's a breakdown of all the individual pieces, and is that a breakdown also of the, the, uh, the process? Right, right? quite of, a bit. Of the, the mold design mm -hmm. and uh, the engine types, it looks like. And then just some of the interiors. And then driving around the driving around Logansport and having and, a great time. And hitting Subway, come on. Because <laughs> even Batman needs to eat fresh. Yep. It's got to fit in the suit. And any day you're driving a Batmobile is a great day. And it, it, it's awesome. Thank you so much you for your bet. time. And you have to let us know if you decide, you know what, I'm going to build something something else. Something else. Something I else, because sure this is awesome. Like I said, big fan, big fan of you know, the, the hot rods and stuff. And this is really cool to see. To the Batmobile. Well, to, Let's go. Collector's case, guys. Enjoy. Stay geeky. <laughs> hey, Junior, when did Batman and Steel have a baby? Junior, hey. Oh, my fault. What's up, dude? What are you listening to, man? Spinner Rack, dude. You ever heard of Spinner Rack? Oh, what's the Spinner Rack? Spinner Rack is a brand new podcast hosted by Big B, Brian Adams, and myself. Now on iTunes and at thespinnerack.podbean.com. Check it out for the latest in all your great comic book conversations. Sounds great. There's another great episode of Comics Remix, man. Uh, here in Logansport, Indiana, the hell of a drive. Cornfields on top of cornfields. But it was worth it, man. We got to totally. see some custom Batmobiles. Totally, totally. Mark showed us Sad. his personal collection. And Mark Wade joined us for a special segment of Breaking the Fourth Wall and gave us a really cool interview. He totally looked like he wanted to punch David in the face over Man of Steel. Mr. Tell, tell me I'm wrong. wrong. You know, I got you, you Mark. Know, I got you. Mark Wade wanted to punch David. I got to sit in not one, but two Batmobiles. And Kerry got to talk to Mark about his personal collection. Got some very beautiful shots. Yep. I want to yep. thank the whole team for coming out here. You can catch this episode and all of our episodes on ComicsRemix.com. For sure. YouTube at ComicsRemix. Facebook, Twitter, ComicsRemix. You can get Just remember Harry, the name. The 101, also on the ComicsRemix channel. Don't forget to uh, also catch some uh, special nerd talk on the Spinner Rack, hosted by Brian Adams and Junior Ruiz. And do you get anything else, man? Um, no, that's basically it. If you need to contact us, contact us by our names at comicsremix.com or through Gmail, comicsremix at gmail.com. Yep. So uh, if any of you guys ever uh, have input, feedback, whatever, let us know. We're always glad to hear it. All right, now we got to go because we're scaring the children. Yeah, we are apparently scaring children, but we're going to sit here and play uh, Suzuka 8 Hours. Let's roll. Boom! Boom! Oh!